Today we'll be hearing from Doug Thompson, Tribal Relations Specialist with the U.S. Forest Service, who will present on uh, treaty relations and treaty rights with the Chippewa National Forest. And with, uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Doug and we'll get moving. Great. Thanks, Madison. So we'll start with the first slide here. You see a picture of the Chippewa National Forest Proclamation Boundary in black and the Beach Lake Indian Reservation in red. And you see the vast overlap. That's the starting point here. You have this, these factual implications because of the way the forest and the reservation overlap. Oops. There we go. So I've been with the Chippewa National Forest for about two and a half years. Um, I was in private law practice doing tribal law representing tribal interests for several years before that and for about a decade before that I was the director of the Nature Conservancy up here in Duluth. So I spend my time back and forth between Leech Lake and, and uh, Duluth, Minnesota. And I was hired in 2017. The reason being was that in 2016, the tribal chair for the, um, the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe wrote a letter to the chief of the Forest Service, Tom Tidwell, stating uh, discontent with the forest management on the Chippewa National Forest and a desire that the desired vegetative, vegetative conditions um, on the National Forest be managed such that they were the, the desired conditions of the band. Um, the, the tribal chair asked for an amendment of our forest plan, which I think was completed in like 05 or roundabouts. And the chief responded, we're not gonna amend the plan at this time. However, we will enter into consultation with our regional foresters. So we have, we've been in consultation since then. And our regional forester has been going back and forth from Milwaukee and doing these consultations with a handful of staff supporting her and the Leech Lake Band. So in the letter back from the chief to um, the tribal chair, the chief gave staff at the Forest Service some direction. And that direction was to discuss and understand the band's desired vegetative conditions so that we would know what we should be managing towards. And also think about this overlap you see here, um, develop a shared decision-making type of process that would have taken into account the desires of both governments. So there was more of an equal sharing in making decisions on national forest lands within the reservation. So the legal relationship, my first thing I did when they hired me was I just started researching all the foundational statutes of the National Forest, which I'll go into here. And also um, the history of the Leech Lake Band establishment of the reservation. You know, there are multiple treaties that establish this reservation and there are a couple of executive orders. But the map is this, 90% of the Leech Lake Indian Reservation falls within the Chippewa National Forest and 45% of the Chippewa National Forest is within the reservation. This is unique within the Forest Service. There's no other national forest that has this kind of overlap. Here in the picture, you have Ben Benoit. Ben is my counterpart over at the Leech Lake Band. He's the director of environmental programs. And Ben says this every time he speaks. This isn't just another forest, and I should put in caps national forest. It's our homeland. So Ben, describes in all of his presentations, and often we present together, um, the overlap that exists as making this unique. So how did this all start? The, the, the Leech Lake Band signed its first treaty in 1855 to establish the reservation. You can see where that falls on the landscape, and you can see where it falls within the 1855 ceded territory we're over here right now. But it's a vast ceded territory. Those lands were ceded in exchange for um, Leech Lake receiving its homeland or establishing the homeland, which was the reservation. And so I, I teach at the Tribal College. I teach uh, the Leech Lake Tribal College. I teach treaty rights and sovereignty. And I usually stop here and ask the students, so what happened? You know, why isn't this all blocked up? And why isn't it all yours um, today? Well, what happened was the Nelson Act. There was a, an allotment act. How many people here know what allotments are? Good, about half the crowd. That's above average, actually. In um, 
1887, Henry Dawes, a senator from Massachusetts, put forward legislation that allowed for um, individual reservations to be allotted. Some people saw it as a way to give American Indians equal footing, come into private ownership. Others saw it as a way to get access to the timber resources on reservations or onto resources on reservations. The Dawes Act itself wasn't an implementation act. It had to have another statute. It would implement it with a, with a tribe or a set of tribes. In Minnesota, that statute was the Nelson Act. And the Nelson Act, um, like a lot of actually out the country, took 40 to 160 acres and gave those lands for 25 years to be held in trust for the tribal members to individual members and families. And after 25 years, those lands were to become um, the patent. They would become owners of those properties. So you can see that, um, explain this map to you. So you can see the just outline of the, of the uh, Leech Lake Indian Reservation without the overlaid outline of the full forest. All of these yellow lands are what became the beginnings of the National Forest. You can imagine there are only so many tribal members. So if you've taken 40 to 160 acres, there would be um, lands left over. Those lands were technically termed surplus lands. And those lands became eligible for non-tribal ownership. So the tribe is now, now that near or the integrity of this reservation has been cracked. If you go and look at, that's actually past, kind of the past. But if you um, think about what was happening, let's go back one. Think about what was happening around these times. The timber barons were moving up. And when they got up to northern Minnesota, everything was quickly, mostly cut. The things that were preserved were the tribal with the reservations. And so these reservations were now surrounded by harvested lands. And Nelson, Senator Nelson, was tied in with the timber industry. So he was, you know, it was a, the statute wasn't applicable to all bands in Minnesota. It was applicable to all the Ojibwe bands except for Red Lake. So you had Black Earth, um, Leech Lake, Fond du Lac, Grand Portage, Boyce Fork. So also around this time, so you had this happen. It, it, the the non-tribal ownership has entered into the reservation. And you can see a lot of that, what is now yellow and what is now national forest lands. Those lands were quickly all cut, just as the lands around the reservation have been all cut. So in around 18, mid 1890s, the Nelson Act was amended again by an act called the Dead and Down Timber Act. And under the Dead and Down Timber Act, if you could find dead and down timber on allotments, that timber was eligible to be taken off, be taken off of the allotments. What would occur is you could run, you know, it could be legitimate, but you could run a brush fire through a 40, 80, 160 and say, dead and down, we're going to go in and cut it. And that's what happened. So it was creating you know, some big issues on the Leech Lake Reservation in particular, to the point that Leech Lake's leadership wrote to DC, wrote to our US leadership and said, look, if you don't fix this Dead and Down Timber Act, there's going to be violence here. We've lost our reservation for the most part. Um, now we're losing all our timber. And now we're losing all of our timber on our own lands that have been now a fraction of what we had. It went from like 850,000 acres to 20,000 acres in just a matter of years. And leadership wasn't listened to. And there was, there was an uprising. And it was, it was on Sugar Point, which is a point out on Leech Lake. This is if you ever are driving back from Walker to here, and you, um, you're, uh, there's this wayside race, uh, rest in Whipple. If you stop here, you can read about the Battle of Sugar Point, and you're looking out at Sugar Point across the way there. It wasn't a huge battle. Um, there were 14 people injured or killed, all federal uh, soldiers, <clears throat> one tribal member. But that tribal member was actually working for the federal government. He was a police officer for the federal government, and they shot him. It was friendly fire. They thought that he was a leech lake here trying to get away. <clears throat> 
And it seems like it wouldn't be a big deal, but you think about what occurred in Minnesota in 1862. You had the Sioux conflict, and in that conflict, hundreds of people were killed, mostly white settlers. It was international news. Do I need to speak up for you? Yeah, a little bit. It was international news. Let me bring it up a little bit. It was international news. So when this occurred, you had 14 injuries or casualties. It quickly made national news, and it was amplified. It was really not, it wasn't correct. It was in the New York Times, the Chicago paper. It was a big enough deal that the Commissioner of Indian, Indian Affairs was on the reservation in D.C. within a couple of weeks saying, look, we need to settle this down. We don't want the same thing to happen. We need to figure a way out of this. And we don't want bloodshed. We want there to be peace. We want to find out what your concerns are. And we want to adjust. So that was followed by a delegation of all the Ojibwe bands <coughs> To, um, to D.C. To, see, to sit with the Senate Commission on, on Indian Affairs. And this is the Leech Lake delegation. I actually worked with a great granddaughter of this gentleman. Um, she's, the, so she's the Dean of Academics at the Tribal College now. But I'll just let people online in the room read this. It was all about temper. Just take your time. I'll give you a minute or so. So this delegation, they asked for certain things. They asked the dead and down timber um, situation be addressed. They, there was an annuity that was going to be paid or was paid for a period of 50 years. So to increase the return on that annuity, the price for pine would be increased from $3 to $4, 1,000 more feet, tiny amount now, but big deal then. It also asked that Indians be employed in the logging industry on the forest. That was quickly followed by the Morris Act of 1902. So now you have the Nelson Act, and then the Nelson Act was amended by the Dead and Down Timber Act, and to fix the, to fix the Dead and Down Timber Act because of the trip to D.C. by the delegation, you now have the Morris Act. And if you look at what was asked for in the previous slide, the tribes got everything they asked for. There was a state intent in the Morris Act of upholding the U.S. trust obligation to the band. Um, it encouraged the employment of Indian labor on what is now the National Forest, dedicated timber cell receipts um, into the trust account, and increased the price of time from three to four dollars per thousand foot feet. These provisions, and I'll explain it to you in a little bit, these amplify what's called the trust obligation on the Chippewa National Forest relative to other federal land holdings. And I'll go into the case law on that. And the Morris Act, the most important thing about the Morris Act from the perspective of the Chippewa National Forest is it created the Minnesota Forest Reserve. So now you have the first national forest, what would become the first national forest created in the system, created by statute. Most national forests are created by executive orders or proclamations. This, stat, this national forest was created by the Morris Act, the statute. And again, that has bearing on the trust obligation of the Chippewa National Forest. Which they came. And the Morris Act didn't address the other reservations. It didn't address Fond du Lac, you know, where we are. It didn't address Grand Portage. It, it addressed Leech Lake, which was hit particularly hard. In 1908, the Minnesota Forest Reserve became the Minnesota National Forest. Um, it went further in the tribal rights. It amended the Morris Act. So now you're talking about all amendments of an allotment act that's created a national forest, which is, you know, it's interesting. It's different. Um, and in this statute, there were provisions for sharing of decisional authority on timber valuation on portions of the national forest. There was also, there's, there's also, that was, these provisions are all still on the books, a provision to protect the Indian graves and the right to bury their dead on the Chippewa National Forest. So now you've arrived at what became, it was renamed in the 20s by proclamation, I believe. And you had the only national forest that was created for the benefit of Indian people, and the first national forest in the Forest Service system created by statute, and one of the few. So again, this is a stopping point. If you're talking to tribal members at Leech Lake, they're like, so what happened? Why is it the way it is here? You know, why do we have um, such a small land base? 
Why is it this way? Well, this all occurred during an era of assimilation, or what's also called the termination era. The Nelson Act, a lot of people don't know that the Nelson Act wasn't like other allotment statutes. Um, it, it allotted individual reservations, but the goal was to move all of the Ojibwe in Minnesota, except for people on Red Lake, out to the White Earth Reservation. The rationale is, the rationale is temporary, as you're starting to trend out into the prairie there. And if you get all the Ojibwe on one reservation, you would have access to the timber on all the other reservations here in the state. It was going to be mandatory. If you look at the congressional record, it was going to be mandatory that that move be made. But if you look at deliberations in the record, you'll see that they were aware that if they did that, there would, in fact, be a huge uprising. So it was a choice that was to be made. It also occurred during the boarding school era. And by the way, going back to this era, this era ran from like eight, late 1880s until just touching on 1930. Full overlap with the boarding school era. Um, the goal um, during the boarding school era was to assimilate again. You took children away from their families. You separated often the kids from each other, the brothers, the sisters, the siblings. You weren't allowed, they weren't allowed to practice their religion, their physical appearance was changed, um, hair was cut, had to wear a uniform, they weren't allowed to speak their language. If you go into the United States Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, current human rights, international human rights law for Indigenous Peoples, this is like the casebook for ethnocide, if it were applied today. So you've had this forced forgetfulness that really hit the Leech Lake Reservation quite hard. In fact, they were left with the smallest percentage of their original land base of all other Ojibwe um, reservations in the state of Minnesota. And that was followed, well, a slide that I don't have is in 1924, you had the Indian Citizenship Act. And that's the act where American Indians became U.S. citizens. Around that time, resource-rich states, like states like you know, here in the upper Midwest, Pacific Northwest, were really realizing the value of tourism. And so they began to want to assert jurisdiction over their law, state laws over tribal members. Wisconsin and Minnesota did it overtly. They both stated, now that these Indians are U.S. citizens, they're subject to our state laws. So just pile it on. You know, land's been taken. Um, valuable resources have been extracted and the right to subsist, which is very important in Indian country, have been quashed. However, a number of decades passed, some tribal members started going to law school, and you got into the civil rights era. And treaty rights were asserted, and they were, the, the battles over treaty rights were brought, brought into court. And if you go, I guess, left to right here, going out to the Pacific Northwest, you had Judge Bolt, Henry Bolt, um, who was a sportsman, sports person. Um, he was conservative um, by politics, and he was an ex-military person. And when the cases came to him in the 1970s, and he opened up the treaties and started to you know, have his clerks look at the case law, he realized there was no other way to find but that these rights still existed. They just had not been exercised, or they'd been quashed illegally by state jurisdiction. And it changed his whole personal life. The, the community that he was part of, the sportsman's community, turned their backs on him. Picture on the left is a, that's not him, but that's an effigy of him being taken down. He'd been hung in a tree in front of the courthouse. That's an FBI agent taking that down. Well, you have a kid that's been tear gassed, a tribal kid that's been tear gassed at fish landing. And because it was the first such finding, um, the state of Washington said, well, you've made the law, now you enforce it. So his military background kicked in, and Judge Bolt said, the NR commissioner is now me. Um, enforcement now lies with the Coast Guard. And he took the, he took the responsibilities of the DNR from the state, and the state quickly succumbed. They realized that they were, it was a federalism. It was a great, it was a federalism crisis, constitutional crisis. And word of that spread, and here you have pictures of protests against treaty rights in Wisconsin, 1980s, 
going into the early 1990s, same type of nastiness. Um, I'm not going to. I, I be careful about what I put up there because there's some really racist slogans that were being held by these protesters at the at the landings and the thing. Their chant was equal rights, equal rights. You know, these are citizens. We're citizens. We need to have equal rights to the resource. And the judge found again. Um, I found again that no, those rights exist. Those rights are inherent rights. Those rights are separate from the rights of other citizens, non-tribal citizens. And so that led to the formation of the LIFWIC, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, which now manages the off-reservation rights. Around the time this was happening um, in Minnesota, Mille Lacs challenged for their rights in the 1837 ceded territory, and they were joined by other tribes because, of course, those ceded territories cross state lines. And it's Minnesota, so it's nice. It's nicer. It's not as much violence. Um, I'm actually good friends with the attorney who represented the state of Minnesota against blacks, and she purposely moved from the attorney general's office to become the assistant commissioner of legal affairs for the DNR to try to avoid all of this craziness that happened in, in these other states. Um, and she worked with, she and a team worked with um, with Mille Lacs and others and came up with settlements of, there were like 100, 100 plus issues and they settled, you know, about 100, 90% of them. So they were heading towards a settlement and it was going to be really favorable for the non-tribal public, sporting public, because Mille Lacs was going to get, among other things, an exclusive use of one part of the lake and some other smaller items. and. Bud Grant intervened, and a lot of people don't know this history. If you're DNR Fisheries and you've been around for a while, he intervened and said, no, let's take this up to the Supreme Court. And they went to the Supreme Court and they lost. And that opened up the entire uh, 1837 territory, not just to Mille Lacs, remember how big those seated territories are, but to all other bands were signatories of that treaty. And so that brings in all the Wisconsin bands, like Cougaray, you know, they all get the benefit of their rights in the 1837 seat of territory, whether it be in Wisconsin or Minnesota. But coming out to Leech Lake, this is a case I wasn't familiar with. Um, I was just aware of was the Herbst case. And Herbst was the DNR commissioner at the time, and I believe he became the undersecretary of, in <clears throat> of interior in the Carter administration. So by virtue of being the DNR commissioner, he gets named on the case. So it's United States and Leech Lake versus Herbst, the state of Minnesota. And assertions went back and forth. There was an assertion or um, on the table that the political and jurisdictional integrity of the Leech Lake Indian Reservation was gone because of the formation of the Chippewa National Forest. And Congress can do that, but they have to be clear and concise. They have to clearly state these rights are no longer there or this reservation is disestablished or abrogated or a tribe is terminated. They didn't use those words. They simply, the Congress created the Chippewa National Forest over an existing Indian reservation. So the court affirmed that the on-reservation rights to hunt, fish, and gather remain on the Leech Lake Indian Reservation and took a step further and said and ruled that um, the non-tribal public would have to pay for the privilege to come onto the reservation to hunt, fish, and gather. They'd have to pay a fee. So at the time, there was an extra tag you would buy. And that got too complicated. So now it's just, I think, 5% of all license sales in Minnesota for the pri privilege of non-tribal non -tribal public to come onto the reservation to hunt, fish, and gather. And that applies not only on tribal land. That applies on federal lands because it Digging through the discovery documents and taking a look at some of the interrogatories pre-trial, you go through this discovery process where the attorneys will get together and they'll ask each other their clients, the other clients, uh, sides clients questions to kind of define the, the contours of, and the detours, the contours of the case. And sometimes it can lead to settlement. Well, in the inter interrogatory between 
the Attorney General and the U.S. Attorney, the AG of Minnesota, asks, Attorney General of Minnesota asks, do you consider these rights property rights? And the response of the U.S. Attorney, his assertion was, yes, these are property rights. So there's a property interest on federal lands within the Leech Lake Indian Reservation, our Chippewa National Forest lands. So when the Chippewa National Forest is managing lands, being aware that that right exists is important. So trust responsibility, how many people are familiar with the federal trust responsibility? Great, good. So um, there is a legal obligation that goes back to the time of treaty making and there's just, you know, hundreds, a couple hundred years of case law that finds that there is a trust responsibility that exists forever between American Indian nations and the U.S. government. So every federal agent, agent, agency owes a trust responsibility. If you think about it, I make the example because a lot of people have had some experience perhaps with trust in their own lives. With, um, you know, there's a trust responsibility for a child. And, and you know, say I could be a trustee. The obligation of the trustee is to manage property or cor the corpus for the benefit of the beneficiary. If you think of the situation on the Chippewa National Forest, the trustee is the U.S. Forest Service. The beneficiary is the Leech Lake Band, and the corpus or the property is the Chippewa National Forest. And normally, I'll stop here, normally the way the trust responsibility works with a, an American Indian tribe and a given agency, because every some people think the BIA is the only agency that owes a trust responsibility. It's every age, every federal agency has a trust responsibility when when doing work with American Indian tribes. Um, and normally it's what's called a bear trust, it's B-A-R-E trust. And under that trust, you can get injunctive relief. You can say, stop doing this, you're hurting our rights. That you know the tribe can say to the to the federal government in court, or the tribe can say, do it better. So, you know, the, the court might say, do it better, or the court might say, stop doing it. So there's no money on the table. But when you get a common law trust, like you do in a private trust relationship between individuals, you know, outside that I described, you know, with a child, um, you have what's called a common law trust. And under a common law trust, if I mismanage, if I'm the trustee, I mismanage the resources of the beneficiary, I can be financially liable for the damages I've caused that individual or that entity um, in a common law. So you get a common law trust, there's what's called compensatory damages on the table. And there was a case on the Quinault Indian Reservation um, back end of the 20th century called USB Mitchell and involved management of timber resources. And in that case, the court, the Supreme Court, US Supreme Court, actually ruled that, hey, this is more like a common law trust because you had this framework of rights. Remember the framework of rights I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation in the Morris Act and the Minnesota National Forest Act? Same type of deal in U.S. v. Mitchell. And it wasn't a one-off. If you look at the history of that case, it's been cited 2,500 plus times since the 1980s, which is significant. So what are the elements of trust responsibility? I've gone through this. You have the trust. That's the relationship. You have the fiduciary duty. That's the duty that's held by the Chippewa National Forest on behalf of the Leech Lake Band. You have the corpus, which is are the lands owned by the National Forest that are on the reservation. And you have the standard of care. You, as a trustee, if any of you ever serve as a trustee, think about it before you agree to it, because you owe a higher duty to that beneficiary than you do to yourself. And it's interesting there because um, I, I, every now and then I'll do something for the Superior National Forest too. I'll step in for my counterpart over here. And um, in both forests, constituents are trying to get into the consultation. We, we fulfill our, our trust obligation through consultation. We have to understand the desires and needs of whatever tribe or band we're working with. And often, well, when we do it, we're going we're gonna to impact a right. You know, you go through this checklist here on the Superior National Forest. You can almost never not check off one of those for just about anything you do on the Chippewa National Forest because of the overlap you have with the reservation. 
but you actually you often have constituents or other constituents who are wanting to get into the consultation and we just can't do it um it can be industry saying look you know these resources affect our interest our financial interest we violate the law if we bring um, industry into the room we also violate the law if we bring environmental advocacy issues into the room because you know over here with all the say mining activities up in the superior you could have environmental groups saying hey we want to be at the table with the tribes because they understand the power of sovereignty the power of sovereignty and they sometimes without really understanding it want to cloak themselves in that power and that just can't happen if it happens we violated our trust responsibility we violated the law on the chippewa national forest there's potential for financial damages if that is the case and that could be proven Oops. So a question I often get asked, I thought about taking the slide out, a question I often get asked is why did it take so long? Why did it take so long to affirm treaty rights in the Herbst litigation? Why did it take so long for the U.S. government in the chief's letter, that the letter went back from the chief to the Leech Lake chair to, you know, basically state, yeah, we understand there needs to be a better, more even decisional process on, on this landscape. And justice, no matter what it is, always seems to take a long arc. Those other cases were all like 100 years post-treaty, the ones I showed earlier. It takes a long time for these things to get to the right place. And it's not been invented. It's just been sitting there dormant for a long time until someone starts to scratch the surface and really look at it. So how are we affected on the Chippewa National Forest? Obviously, we had this overlap which you have the practical implications of that we also have the, there's also the fact we were created by statute which um and it has a framework of rights embedded in those statutes that have never been amended never been taken out and that amplifies our trust responsibility potentially to become a common law trust it's not a bare trust and in litigation, the U.S. Attorney has asserted that, yes, these rights, the rights to hunt, fish, and gather are property rights, and they're affected by the land management on the national forest. So almost all of the management activities on the Chippewa National Forest affect a tribal property right. And that leads us into this new world of having to think more deeply about the best management alternatives for the interest of the Leachland Band which is happening through consultation right now. That's it. Any questions? I kind of zoom through that. I'm looking at the clock. I want to give time for conversation. You've been quiet. So I have one. I don't know that you work with Lake, but can you tell me the reason why Red is that reservation? No, no, they, they just resisted effectively. They just resisted. And I don't know the full, there's some good, Anton Troyer um, yeah. has some good writings on that. And um, I would suggest you read some of his work. I mean, I, I was able to understand some of this history by reading some of Troyer's work, um, but they just said no, they resisted. Can you repeat the question for the online audience? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. The question was asked, um, why Red Lake wasn't allotted it, and they just resisted effectively. But the story is deeper than that. I think for the people online, read Anton Troyer's books. Any other questions? Sure, in the consultation process, how do you rectify a remedy when the US Forest Service is trying to do one thing and each way wants something else, how do you cover the table and who wins that argument, I guess, when you're just fundamentally opposed and there's maybe no middle ground? Yeah, that's a good question. And I'll, I can tell you it's hard. It's really hard. Um, the one thing that's required and, and um, we're trying to put in, well, it's in place. If there's going to be a management, management alternative that's not going to be consistent with a leech lake request, that has to be placed in writing and the rationale has to be laid out. And um, and then dispute resolution can be handled a number of different ways after that. But it's um, 
you do end up there sometimes, as you probably know, because I do with Fond du Lac, right? Right. So you do end up there, um, but it creates a level of dialogue that's government to government, and at least a platform to stand on and work with each other on. It's about as clear as that. <laughs> it's not easy. Any others? Has there been talk about uh, 50 or 100 years ago, the bands were really no position to be able to manage their own lands in sort of the modern sense, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly that that's not the case anymore. A lot of bands have very developed resource management programs. Um, has there been talk about returning some of these federal lands back to trust ownership under each state's governance? Well, that, that's that, the question. Oh, Sorry. okay. Okay. I'm, I'm going to have you come up and ask it, actually. And I'm like, can you come up and talk in the microphone? Because <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mangle it. I think I can answer it for you. Okay, my question was, um, basically, has there been talk about the bands regaining their lands that were originally taken under the Allotment Act and subsequently turned into U.S. Forest Service lands? Um, you know, Leech Lake, I know, has a highly developed resource management program. We would probably be capable of managing effectively many more acres than they currently do. Um, has there ever been talk about basically restoring that federal land back to bands ownership? Yeah, a couple, well, a couple of things. So let's go back to the Wisconsin cases. One of those cases did involve commercial timber management. The tribes asserted that they wanted to be able to commercially manage um, there's some of the, I think, county lands in Wisconsin, probably federal and state too. And the court in that case said at the time, um, the commercial timber harvest wasn't part of your thing, it wasn't what you did. But the ironic thing is, is that with hunting, fishing, and gathering, the provision is that as, as the ability to use technology to hunt, fish, and gather um, increased, became you know, more moder modernized, those modern means could be used, but you had this one decision that says not for commercial timber harvest. It doesn't affect secondary forest products, you know, and cultural uses of the landscape. But the closest thing that's happening, right, two things are happening, and the next thing that's happening is you have the new farm bill and the opportunity to 638, so you can have potentially tribal management of federal resources. And I'm here, I was hoping to phone up on all the webinars yesterday. I've been meaning to for weeks, but I've been working so hard on this. I understand the new farm bill because they're all kind of interesting provision about tribal rights. So there could be something there. And there is a bill that's going through right now to do some restoration of the Leech Lake Indian Reservation of, I think it's like 11,000 acres. It's, it's, not, it's being taken forward by Leech Lake um, to restore some of the lands that became National for part of the national forest in certain ways during a second termination era during the 1940s um, that Leech Lake is trying to get back. So there never seems to be a really clear answer in Indian country. There's always a lot of moving parts. Um, good, good question. We have a couple of questions from online. So the first question is how does Leech Lake uh, determine what its members want? Uh, do they have any disagreement? Just like we do. Yes, you, that's unavoidable. Uh, and then they have a political process. They have a tribal council. They have a chair. They have agencies. Um, Unleashed Lake, you also have what are called uh, LICs, local Indian communities. There are 11 of them on the reservation. And I often think of the LICs or local Indian um, communities. They have councils, local Indian councils, as how if you were dealing off reservation here, how you would be dealing with townships. And those politics all percolate up just like they do in the non tribal world. It, it's all politics are messy. And then a second question. Uh, this uh, individual asked Do you have any ideas why there was no compensation from the Forest Service provided to Leech Lake Band for the Mississippi Meadows fire trespass? You know, I've been asked, I'm not familiar with what happened there, and I've been asked the question, and I need to understand it to be able to answer it. But that's, that, I've been asked that before by tribal members. That was pre me. My only understanding is it was a prescribed burn conducted by the Forest Service that escaped out of 
Forest Service boundaries onto each lake land. Yes, I think in the ball club area. Yeah, I don't know how that ultimately played out or why it was contentious that yeah. the Forest Service looked at this compensated the landowner like you would if you accidentally got too much timber on the other side of the line or something. Any others, Madison? I don't see any other questions from online, so I'm going to give folks a minute or two to finish typing if they're currently typing a question. But we'd love to. Uh, oh, there's another question that came in. Um, this individual asked that they understand that Red Lake is different and how much similarity with the other tribes in Minnesota. So that's a good question, too. Um, so the bands, you have the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, which is actually their offices are out about three or four miles from our um, Forest Service office and even closer to the Leech Lake Division of Resource Management offices. And the Minnesota Chippewa tribe has a constitution and White Earth, Leech Lake, Fond du Lac, Grand Portage, and Boyce Fort all operate under that constitution. There's a there's an executive council and it's made up of the chair and I believe the secretary of each band that gets together on um, broad tribal issues. Red Lake's not part of that. They they have their own thing. They have their own governance. It's all on reservation. It's, it's a closed reservation. That reservation was never allotted. It's still all together for the most part. That's interesting. Uh, but what happened with Red Lake is interesting. I was going to ask about the analysis and how um, when things like that were coming uh, how was or were the tribes notified, if at all? So the question was, when the Nelson Act was coming to be, how were the tribes notified? You know, I don't know exactly what went down then. It kind of came down to them. It was handed to them. You know, it was federal law, and it became, it was operable. I don't, I, I would like to know that history. I'd like to know how it was, well, here tribes, here's what, Right. What we have like for you. Know, bait switch. Like here, you can have 40 acres now, and it's yours. But yeah. then, you know, they uh, small piece of that got passed. It. Well, there's not enough to, to give away at all. You know, there's more land than there are people. So all the 40 acres that that they get, we get the rest and we have whatever we want. Yeah. And yep. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize there was a settlement too under the Nelson Act recently, and it was it was um, I think it was 20 million dollars. Um, it was going to be split between the tribes that are part of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe. And then they were, could figure out how to do it. And um, and then it grew, interest grew, grew to be like $28 million. And, you know, some like on Leech Lake, you would say, we should get more because we have vast land loss. If you're a white earth, you, should, you might say, we should get more because we have a larger population. If you're a smaller band, you might say nothing. <laughs> Because it's all going to be split evenly, which means the per unit payout for tribal gov governments and citizens um, would vary according to the size of the you know. But it was all split evenly. So it, when you split that up between the five bands, then to be divvied up with you know the government and the citizens, um, it ended up not being a lot. So there's been acknowledgement the Nelson Act um, land was taken. Can I just add to the, some the other history behind that? Is there, so these communities were getting um, the new wooden tables with the treaties that they signed, and sometimes they were not arriving on time, not coming at all. These were this was food and supplies, and so these people were under pressure. Yeah. Um, for survival. So a lot of times they're pressured into signing these things. Right. Like yep. So the, the statement made was that a lot of, there was a lot of, there's a lack of resources because there were annuities that were supposed to be coming to reservations and sometimes they weren't coming in full or they weren't coming at all. So there was a lot of pressure that folks are under. And the way that's been handled through the years, um, well, I, it's like, what's the most common signature on a treaty? Your tribal member. It was X because you couldn't spell, so you're at this disadvantage. So the way that the law works in Indian country is you have what are called the canons of construction. And under the canons of construction, when you have rights that were 
perhaps unjustly or were definitely unjustly affected back, you know, in the mid 19th century because of, you know, power imbalance, language, you know, inability to communicate, and a dominant player at the table. The way that those equities, you know, think of the scales of justice, the way they're balanced are what's called the canons of construction. So nowadays, when you look at federal, if you look at statutes, you look at treaties, and it's like this, and the lower end is the tribe. When the court looks at the treaty, first they say, okay, so we're going to construe this favorably in favor of the tribe, and the scale does that. And then it gets to about there, and they say, if there's any ambiguities, we're going to construe those in favor of the tribe. It does that. And then finally, we're going to look back at what the tribe would have thought back in 1855, and we're going to look from their perspective. Would they have expected the right to hunt, fish, and gather? And it does that. So, you know, they're, they're, they're not, it's not a fix, but it's an adjustment to take into account the inequities of that time. And you're right, there was a lot of pressure. So last month we saw a webinar by Joseph Bauer Kemper, mm -hmm. also about treaty rights. And um, it was in, he basically said that that canons of um, construction was very similar to or maybe even based on contract law. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's out of contract law. Because the treaty is a contract, and it's a forever contract. Based on the fact that he draws it, uh, has the presumption against it, the person who didn't draw it made the understanding. Right. Yeah, he had a, he had a good list of Yeah, Joseph, five, five Joseph, counts. Joseph's very good. Um, and in there, I've had people say, well, these are ancient documents, shouldn't they go away? And, my common retort or answer to that is, well, I Treaty of Paris was 1783. We can let that go away, right? And the answer is, yeah, yeah. And then it's like, you understand, that's what formed the United States. We would go back to Great Britain. No, they don't go away. They don't go away. You said that the Dawes Act is, I forget exactly what you said, but not implementable. And then Nelson Act is what actually made yeah. to happen. I've never heard that. Either. Yeah, so the Dawes Act said, we can have allotments, but they have to be in. They, they have to happen on an individual basis, not person to person. But you know, we'll do it with a set of reservations or with a reservation. But there has to be an Implementa implementation act. And here in northern Minnesota, the implementation act was then also. That's so kind of the details that that the Dodds Act didn't have. Yeah, well, that's what it did. Yeah, it had details like, for example, we would prefer that all Ojibwe members of those five bands live on the Leech Lake Reservation. And the fact that it could be, when it was individually um, amended under the Dead and Down Timber Act, that didn't apply to, it only applied to the, the, the five bands that were affected by the Nelson Act. It didn't apply nationwide. So it's a federal statute that in effect becomes kind of local, local law, local policy. Yep. Any more questions from here from the CFC? All right, there are no other questions online. Let's give Doug a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, and just to wrap up today's webinar, we hope you join us next month um, for our July webinar. That will be on Tuesday, July 16th. And we'll be hearing about oak wilt next month. So um, the biology, distribution, and management approaches of oak wilt. And again, uh, just as a reminder, uh, we did record this webinar. I know we had a couple people say that there was some spotty audio in the beginning, and we'll try to fix that on the recording. Um, so if you missed anything at the beginning, um, we'll make sure to, to remedy that in the recording. And then once again, another round of applause for Doug, and uh, we'll see you next month.